Um, so I'm here to represent um, project number four, Atomic Scale Studies of Catalysis by Spinel Oxides. I'll quickly go over the aims of the project before I start. Um, the idea is to develop complex uh, spinel oxide model systems with, with atomic scale control. Um, we want to understand how different cation combinations then affect the reactivity, um, initially with a case study reaction being a uh, water gas shift. Uh, we aim to develop mo uh, also methods to work in high pressure and liquid environments and to provide uh, experimental benchmark data to, to Karin and Bacchus, uh, sorry, and Ellen Bacchus um, and, the the and the theory groups. Um, okay, so the great thing about convincing Ellen and Karin to work on uh, spinels is that we already have a, a model system which, which serves really nicely for this uh, type of work. Basically, what we do is we, we take... Um, uh, iron oxide single crystals, and um, we spot to them in ultra high vacuum with argon and then anneal and oxygen. And what we get typically in STM is an, is, is an image that looks something like this. Now, if the spinel uh, surface, so this is a, an idealized bulk, bulk truncation at the 100 plane of a spinel, um, if it looked like that, then these rows of iron, and ca iron cations should be perfectly straight, um, but they're not. Uh, what actually happens is that the surface uh, reconstructs when we treat it this way, and um, in each unit cell, uh, two of these subsurface cations are replaced by one uh, in the subsurface here, so uh, like, like so. And this produces uh, the reconstruction and uh, these undulating iron cations that we see in the STM. Now, um, Yesterday, Michaela talked a lot about how important it is to, to understand the structure of these surfaces uh, really well. And actually, um, maybe six or seven years ago now, uh, this was the first system that we treated in this way in our group um, with, with lead IV. And uh, Lutz Hammer did this investigation pre-Viper lead. So I got uh, roughly monthly emails complaining about how complicated it was and how much of a pain it was to do this lead analysis. But uh, eventually he came up with um, uh, a, a confirmation of our, uh, of our structure, which we proposed on the basis of uh, STM and DFT. And um, what we got in the end was uh, an R factor, a lead R factor of 0 0.125, which is actually, um, I think, one of the very best ever achieved on an oxide. So uh, the point is that we, we understand the structure of this surface really, really well. And this is a nice basis for uh, doing reactivity experiments in the future. Um, one of the nice things that we've been doing over recent years with this surface is to, to modify it with different cations. So this is kind of one of the PR figures from a, a paper that we published recently. Um, and what you can see pretty much is that when we deposit metals of various types on this surface, um, they all absorb as single atoms. You can see that on the face of these different cubes here. And they're all absorbing in the exact same place. Um, now, in the TACO project, actually, we're much more interested in the 3D transition metals, so copper, uh, nickel, and, and other ones in this row, uh, less so uh, in, these, uh, in these other metals that you see here. Um, one of the reasons for that, actually, is that all of these metals here, when you heat them up, essentially, they sint to get sintered together into larger nanoparticles. Um, but actually, the 3D transition metals behave a little differently, uh, and that's what we really plan to utilize in this project. And actually, uh, I'll show you now some data for uh, cobalt. And actually, this is the data that helped us realize what was going on in this system uh, with the subsurface cation vacancies. And basically, what we were doing was depositing cobalt onto the surface. And these are our cobalt additums. And we had approximately half as many cobalt additums as we thought we should have on the basis of the quartz crystal microbalance uh, calibration. But we also have these features here, these sort of elongated features uh, on the iron rows. And actually, if you take an STM movie of this system and watch from frame to frame, then what you see actually is that these cations uh, slowly incorporate within the oxide uh, at room temperature. So if you look at these two frames, sequential frames, um, this cation here, so this atom essentially, uh, diffuses between this frame, so it's gone in the next one, goes there, and now we have an, an incorporated cobalt. Actually, we found that it goes into the subsurface layer, filling the vacancy. And actually, this is how we realize these vacancies must be there. For these atoms to incorporate into the surface, there has to be a place for them to go at room temperature. 
And this is how we kind of realized in the very beginning that this subsurface cations must be there. You don't see anything in the STM really that tells you that. Um, so it's not just about you know, isolated species. Uh, this was work we did a couple of years ago with Juan Figuera in Spain. And basically we found that if we deposit lots of cobalt, so now this is 25 cobalt atoms per unit cell. Unit cells about this area here. And what you see is that you get a mixture of cobalt. Two plus this is the cobalt going into the oxide, and then you pile up uh, cobalt metal on top of that. But if you then heat the system up, then what you see is that it all goes into the oxide, and now you have exclusively cobalt two plus incorporated into your uh, Fe3 or four. So you've made cobalt ferrite in the surface layers. Um, if you heat a little bit higher, so to 733 actually, this is almost a stability limit for this type of work we want to do. You have the problem that all of this cobalt then disperses into the bulk of the single crystal. So um, you have to stay at least in this temperature range in the beginning uh, if you want to use magnetite single crystals as your model system. Okay, now I mean I said we're going to talk about um, water gas shift today. Um, I'll briefly mention why it's interesting. I mean this, this um, was figured out really a long time ago uh, in the 20s or something. This and the, the catalyst has always been um, Fe304, the industrial catalyst for this. Um, but this Fe304 is stabilized um, by uh, chromium. And then essentially there was no research done on this for a long time. And then in 2000, um, it was made a legal requirement to get rid of hexo hexo hexavalent chromium. Uh, from these catalysts. And then there's been much more interest in this system uh, recently as people try to figure out either how to instead make the magnetite uh, stable against sintering or to develop some other catalysts which can replace it industrially. Um, the mechanism by which it's supposed to work uh, is this redox mechanism that you see here. And essentially what's supposed to happen, your CO comes, it's oxidized to CO2 by taking an oxygen from the lattice. So now you have an oxygen vacancy in this depiction here. And then water comes, uh, reacts with the surface, fills the vacancy with an oxygen, leaving hydrogen, which recombine to give you your hydrogen off. And then you can go around in this, in this cycle uh, of oxidizing and reducing uh, your Fe304, uh, your doped Fe304. OK, now we're going to study that. And um, as well as using the STM and the AFM, uh, what we're going to use is a, another vacuum chamber that we have, uh, which you see on the right-hand on side here. Um, really what's important about this is that we, it uses, it utilizes a liquid helium flow cryostat, so we can cool the sample uh, to do TPDs, temperature program desorption. We have a molecular beam for dosing reactants to the surface. Uh, we have also photoelectron spectroscopies and ion scattering. And then in the future, um, near, very near future, hopefully, infrared uh, iris. Uh, which would allow us to give uh, frequencies uh, for various adsorbates to the theoretical groups. Uh, all the theory that I will show is done by Matthias Meyer, uh, who's working with Cesare Francini. Okay, so if we start with CO, I mean, CO is the first reactant of our, of our interest for our water gas shift. Then what we see is that on the bare Fe304, CO fizzes orbs very weakly. Uh, it's all desorbed here. If we deposit it at low temperature, it's all desorbed roughly by 150 Kelvin. So the interaction with CO is, is, is pretty damn weak. Um, we see, I mean, uh, the nice thing about using molecular beam is that we, we can calibrate exactly how much CO we put. And what we see is that we fill the surface with four COs per unit cell. And actually, if you look at the magnetite here, there's, there's four ions per unit cell. So it makes complete sense. Each ion can host one CO, and that's it. Um, now, if we deposit our additional cations onto this surface, so we make a very local ferrite, so to say, and uh, we repeat our COTPDs. What we see is that on the right-hand side here, you see what happens. So additional copper gives you a peak here. Additional silver gives you a, a desorption peak here. Gold, well, yeah. Nickel, even higher still. And then these metals that we're not so interested in are, are very uh, more strongly binding uh, CO uh, to the system. Um, one thing that's kind of, it, what was interesting in the paper that we published actually was how different these, these cations are to the metal surfaces. That's what you see in the open, uh, the open symbols here. But I think more in the context of what we're talking about here, it's quite interesting that, for example, rhodium and uh, iridium behave a lot more like their respective oxide. So CO binds um, to iridium oxide with almost this same binding energy here that, that we see for a single iridium cation sitting on the magnetite. 
So really, you get very much like oxide behavior. So this should be interesting for our ferrites uh, as a model system, I think. I said that we're going to do water gas shift. So what we need out of this is, is, uh, is CO2. We need CO to go to CO2. Um, and what we find is that the only situation we can see that in a TPD is when we have platinum, rhodium, or iridium uh, adsorbed on the surface. We don't see this uh, for the other metals in, in this type of experiment. Um, but there's something nice I can show you anyway about the platinum. And that is um, we can do these kind of in situ reactivity experiments. So um, what happens here? So this is our sample mounted on a sample plate. Uh, the beam spot comes in, and uh, this is the area of the sample which is exposed to the molecular beam. And then here, looking in the window of the chamber, you can see in the back here the molecular beam source. This shoots in the reactants to this uh, sample, which is here, which then is very line of sight directly to the mass spectrometer here. So basically, um, you can do like an in situ uh, scattering experiment and me measure products. And for example, when we took our platinum single atom sat on, on top of this magnetite, and then we, at some point, we fire uh, CO into the chamber. We see immediately CO2 come, and then a, a slow decline in the amount of CO2 which we're producing. I, I didn't really mention, but the surface is labeled by oxygen 18. It just, all this isotopic labeling, CO13 and, and these things, they just help us to distinguish what we have from the background. Um, Anyway, we, we labeled the surface with oxygen 18, which is not difficult to do. Uh, and what you see is that you get this uh, slow decrease in the reactivity. And this correlates with, in the beginning, you have the atoms doing the reaction. And uh, after a little while, these atoms sinter together, and you have nanoparticles doing the reaction. Um, what's kind of interesting, actually, is that what you see here are holes in the magnetite surface associated with uh, the, platinum cat the platinum nanoparticles. Um, and actually, inside these holes, you can see the next layer down of the material. So um, what's actually happening here is that uh, our CO is coming to the surface, binding to the platinum nanoparticles, and then it's sort of being able to extract an oxygen from a step edge. You see many of these are sitting at the step edges here. Uh, this seems to be the most favorable place to get them out. But once you've made the oxygen vacancy here, this iron cation doesn't want to be a cation at the surface anymore. It's much more favorable to have this as an interstitial iron in the bulk than it is to have an oxygen vacancy in the surface. So basically, we etch away the surface, but it still looks very much like nice Fe304. OK. Um, one of the things we're really interested to do in TACO is to look uh, at higher, um, higher FCO uh, pressures. I mean, it's, it's worth to say that. I mean, this experiment was done at 550 Kelvin. So you can clearly see that you, know, you should be able to reduce the oxide at 550 Kelvin. Here, the platinum's trapping you the CO, but it, you have enough energy to extract the oxygen out from the lattice. OK, so now let's then see what happens if we go to high pressures. Um, we built a high pressure cell, uh, which you see over here. But it's not so easy to see, so I made like a kind of crappy YouTube animation to show you how it works. Um, the way it works is that we have our magnetite sample prepared in UHV, and it sits on a, a heatable stage. You can't see the sample in this picture. And then we have a quartz tube, which comes uh, and presses against the sample. So this is all within our, our UHV chamber. And then the quartz tube comes in. It's pressed against the sample with a very, uh, very de well-defined force defined by the springs that you see here. And uh, then we fill the tube with CO, and in this case, the best we've done is 29.3 millibars. And when you do that, because you don't seal perfectly well, you have some leak leakage out from inside the tube into the UHV chamber. And with 29.3 millibars inside the tube, we have just about UHV remaining in the outside parts. So that this is really just the seal of the, um, of the tube against the sample, which is defining this, this leak rate. In principle, we can measure products uh, in this chamber of, by, by looking at this uh, gas which leaks out, but we, we haven't done that yet. Um, one of the downsides of this setup, as nice as it is, is that this is a picture of what one of our natural crystals typically looks like when we're straight out of the box. And one of the things you can see are these kind of faint hairline fractures in the material. So of course, as soon as you try to heat it to 500 C and press it with a force, it cracks. Right? So I mean. We, it's worked pretty well up to now, but 
And it works for many experiments, but eventually it cracks along one of these, uh, along one of these lines. And uh, you know, these samples are 500 euro each, so I would, I would boom through my consumables budget pretty quick if we were doing these experiments all the time. Um, so in the end, what happened now is that SurfaceNet have got a, uh, a floating zone furnace and they will make us synthetic samples. We got the first few and they're, they're much better, at least from this uh, lack of these natural inclusions and, uh, and fractures point of view. So that, that should be better uh, going forward. The experiments that we have done, here's an example. Um, this is our, our surface as prepared. And then this is after 0.6 millibars of CO at 350C, so 623K. And what you see is not that much difference actually uh, between the two. So there doesn't seem to be this massive tearing apart of the surface if you were reducing it by CO. I mean, I was concerned bef before we did this experiment that maybe I would be left with just a lump of iron. You know, if we heat in CO, you may reduce it so quickly that, uh, that you reduce it all the way to metallic iron. But uh, that really doesn't happen, at least in the conditions that we've looked at so far. You get some blobs on here, which are most likely just carbon. You see carbon in the XPS. Uh, but we're trying to improve uh, the setup. This is just really the beginning. Uh, if you look yeah, uh, even more closely at this image on the right, then actually you can see the, the atomic scale structure is still the same. You just have these blobs of carbon around uh, on the sample. So no reduction happens. What's super weird about this, and the next, next slide I'll show you is strange in my point of view, from my perspective. And that is if, if we do the same experiment now with water, so we just heat in water at, at 350 degrees C, and now we don't even need the high pressure cell, we just do this in ultra high vacuum, 10 to the minus six millibars. What we get is this, the effect that we expected to see when we heated in CO. <coughs> So what we expected to see heating in CO was some etching of the surface, some holes here, etching at the step edges like we see up there. But what we see is this effect when we heat in water. Kind of bizarre. I don't understand this yet. So anybody that wants to suggest something, then please tell me. Uh, yeah, it kind of works backwards to what I think. For me, the water should oxidize this surface. And what I see is something which ap apparently looks like reduction. Um, we also have these new defects appear on the surface, uh, which we we don't know what they are. They are new for us. So yeah, there's some interesting stuff even from our kind of initial uh, experiments looking at water gas shift just on bare magnetite. Um, I should, I want to say a little bit more about water. So maybe I'll just quickly show you uh, what happens on the surface with water. So I mean, normally we focus very much on what happens in the monolayer regime. Uh, this is all low temperature stuff. We published this a few years ago. But really for the purposes here, we care more about what happens kind of from here onwards. Um, the first thing that happens is that this tiny little peak in TPD, this comes of, from recombinative desorption from defects. So this is our clean surface, and this is a domain boundary in the reconstruction. And then here you see, if we, if we now adsorb water, heat to here, and look in the STM, what we see is that the last bit that we have here is, is lining these defects on the surface. So we get dissociative ad adsorption at certain places above room temperature. Um, if you look in XPS, you can just about see this, I think, that you have some OH remaining on the surface. Um, it's, yeah, it, it's hard to say, but it, it, we definitely don't have a peak from molecular water. That's, that's the point. So it looks like water dissociates at this place. The other thing which, is, which happens here is at even higher temperatures, so that this is like a zoom in on this region here, we have this long tail here, which is... Uh, desorption of water, which is recombining. So on our clean surface, we always have uh, these guys. So these are surface OH groups, and these come about because when we, when we prepare the surface, there is always some oxygen vacancies. And the oxygen vacancies react with water from the background, and what we have then is these two OH groups. And they look like they do, two brighter iron cations, because actually the, the OH sits here, and its presence affects the density of states of the two ions sat next to it, and therefore we see it brighter in the STM. Now normally it's trapped in this site, and it goes backwards and forwards and backwards and forwards in our STM images. Um, and then, yeah, I, I show you briefly that this also happens even at high temperature. So this is a 353K, so Barbara Lechner took this image for me in Munich, and you can see, hopefully this plays. Yeah, so these are our OH groups just sitting trapped in this location bouncing backwards and forwards between these two places. 
But when we heat up even higher, they're able to come out from this location and diffuse uh, further around across the surface. Okay, so actually there's something happening at high temperature which is linked to surface hydroxyl groups. And you know, when we dose water, we have very few of those because we have so few oxygen vacancies. So we can think about what happens instead if we dose atomic hydrogen. Okay, then we can artificially increase the amount of surface hydroxyl groups which we have uh, and investigate what happens there. And um, yeah, this is another experiment where we took our natural single crystal, so with its oxygen 16, we annealed it in oxygen 18 for, I think it was an hour at 10 to minus 6 millibar, and this converts almost all of the oxygen in the surface to oxygen 18. Um, so this gives us like a nice isotopically labeled surface to work with. Then we deposit atomic, well, we do everything isotopically labeled. So as I'll say atomic hydrogen just through uh, force of habit, but actually it's D. Um, we dosed D2 and cracked this onto the surface to give us uh, adsorbed uh, deuterium. And you can see this, that the, 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 uh, it was kind of well done because now you have some reduction of the surface. This is an increase in the ion 2 plus content uh, over here of the surface. And then this here is our, our OH shoulder in the oxygen 1S. So this uh, deposition of the hydroxyls works uh, completely nicely. We can have two kind of coverage regimes, sub monolayer and then high H is like really when we hammer it with as much uh, atomic hydrogen as we, we can. And then if we do a TPD of this, what we see is for the low coverage, we see a peak here, which is I think water adsorbed during our atomic H deposition. And then at high temperature, we have this same feature that we saw uh, on the previous slide uh, at around 550 Kelvin, something like that. And this is really the surface being eaten apart by these hydroxyl groups. They don't dissolve as hydrogen. They come together on the surface, they extract an oxygen out from the lattice and dissolve as, as this. So it really seems that actually, you know, having the two hydrogens on the surface here is not going to give us hydrogen like we want from our water, water gas shift reaction. We're only going to see water dissolve in this case. Um, one qu quick thing I thought I'd show very quickly just to show um, that this happens at the step edges. So this was an experiment we did a while ago where we had these platinum nanoparticles. And we also exposed it to hydrogen. And what we found is that um, the hydrogen would dissociate on the platinum nanoparticles, spill over onto the oxide, and then actually diffuse away to the step edge where they would make these holes. So you, you can see that in many cases you have these platinum particles sat inside the holes. Um, and yeah, the reason why the holes grow away from the particles rather than the particles sitting at the edge is because this, this hydroxyls diffuse to the edge. That's the easiest place to get the oxygen out. And then that's where, that's where we get this uh, water desorption take place. Okay, so I mean, coming back to this, I don't understand it, <laughs> right? I, I don't understand it, let me say that. But there's something interesting even more than what I said already about it. Um, this is low energy ion scattering data, which is done on essentially a, a mirror image, a mirror of this experiment. And we start with uh, our surface, which is enriched with oxygen 18. We then heat it in water at just over 500 Kelvin. Uh, this was five minutes. And what you can see is that already a large amount of the oxygen in, oxygen in the surface has converted to oxygen 16. So even though it looks like here, okay, you have some defects and some small holes, Already here, almost all of the our surface oxygen is actually already converted to the other isotope. So there's really a hell of a lot going on, actually, when we adsorb water on the surface at high temperature, a lot more than we expected to see in the beginning. Uh, last few minutes, uh, I want to just mention that we've done, you know, it looks to us like we can't really reduce with CO. We can't get hydrogen off. So our water gas shift's looking pretty ropey at this point. Um, so what we decided was to investigate a little bit a, a, an alternative mechanism that's been proposed, so-called associative mechanism, essentially where you have water come to the surface, dissociate, react together with CO to make some intermediate, and then this decomposes to make your products. So, I mean, we looked at this. Uh, we went to the synchrotron actually a little while ago, uh, and we, we had co-adsorbed water and CO at the same time on our magnetite surface. So initially we started with 10 to the minus M eight millibar of CO and 10 to minus six, and you see these of water, and you see these peaks grow slowly, multiple peaks in the carbon region. And then if we then increase the water pressure to 10 to the minus five, this thing really kicks off and we start accumulating 
various different species on our, on our, uh, on our surface, which are clearly distinct. Um, the oxygen 1s, yeah, you see corresponding uh, speeches. Now, one of the nice things about the TACO is that I had a meeting together with Christoph and uh, Karen, and Karen, Christoph said to me, I've seen this data before, published it, in fact, as part of the FOXY. Um, and that was really nice, actually, because we spent a hell of a long time won wondering what these different peaks were. And uh, Christoph had already put a lot of thought into it, so that was really nice. Um, he'd seen essentially the same thing, but here he was dosing water and CO2 on Taconia. But anyway, these different peaks were attributed to formate, dioxymethylene, uh, formaldehyde, and, and the carbon accumulation on the surface. So, yeah, I think I'll go with that for now, till we know better. Um, this, this peak from formate on the right-hand side is kind of interesting because we can, we can make this by an alternative path. So we can deposit formic acid onto the surface, which will then adsorb dissociatively, making adsorbed formate. And if we do that, then you see up the top here, we get an adsorbed monolayer, essentially, of formate. And it's nice. We can look at the decomposition of this formate species by doing a TPD. And what we see is that if we do that, um, yeah, this is not so important. If we, if we do that, then what we see is that the formate decomposition gives us water, CO, HCO, and CO2. Again, no hydrogen. So even this alternative mechanism also sort of gives us some CO2, which we're after, but doesn't look like it's going to produce hydrogen in the end. So in summary, um, we've looked at the water gas shift reaction. CO doesn't seem to reduce the bare surface very well. Maybe, hopefully, cation doping will change this. Let's see. Maybe going to higher temperatures will also help. Um, a hydrogen desorption doesn't look like it's going to happen on this surface. It just doesn't. It wants to come off as water if you have hydroxyl groups. Maybe, hopefully, cation doping will change this. Let's see. Um, the high-pressure cell looks pretty good, and the development of the electrochemical cell I haven't shown I is ongoing. With that, I, I finish. Uh, this is my, my group in Vienna. I showed work, actually, from Oscar, Hansa, and, uh, and Jan. Um, Manuel was on the TACO project, but left uh, now to be a computer programmer instead. And Chun Lei Wang is a new postdoc who will start on the project starting in November. With that, I'll stop and try to answer questions apart from about what's happening with the water. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. OK. Tja. Thank you, Gareth. So are there questions? The one that I would like to ask was not allowed. I'm not allowed <laughs> to ask. <laughs> However, you can speculate, if you like. <laughs> <laughs> So, questions, Günther. You showed that when you had the, like the platinum atoms on the iron oxide, and then you did sort of a temp CO temperature program reduction. Essentially, yeah. And yeah. that was okay. And when you do the isotope labeling, then I, I would assume in the platinum, the oxygen eighteen dissociates, and then you start to. But you do it also without without uh, platinum, and you said it's so fast. Uh, it's relatively. So how is the how high is the annealing temperature? So. Uh, we also did tests, of course, of how long the atomic labeling stays in the surface. And actually, you can see it in that uh, here. Actually, this blue curve at the end, this is what happens. I should go through this a bit. I, I was conscious of the time. So the first two curves, the black one is clean as prepared with oxygen 18 mm -hmm. under the conditions that we say. So heating at like uh, 500 C and oxygen 18 for a while. Mm -hmm. Then the experiment with the water's red. And then the experiment with in green, this is outside of our beam spot, so where we're not exposing it to the water. And you see already some, some change. And this is, ex this is exchange of oxygen 18 and 16 with the bulk, right, which happens there. And then the blue curve is what happens if you kneel all the way to 950K. So this is really our annealing temperature. It still stays mostly oxygen 18. So it's actually fairly stable. The oxygen diffusion through the lattice is not so large. Um, we don't, need a, we don't need platinum in order Easy. to do that. Yeah. Right? We just heat in the oxygen. Mm. But, but the maybe the, the oxygen 18 dissociates on, the s on some step edges of the surface, or oh. is it on a terrace? So it's, it's so so I, amazing oh, that I it's so what you're easy. At now. So that you, so, you know, that you have sort of this quantitative 
exchange and not just parts of the surface. I, I understand now what you're getting at. Actually, this is something which is quite interesting about the surface in general, and that is that the surface kind of breathes. So if you, if, if you anneal this surface in oxygen, we always wondered in the beginning why we got such beautiful surfaces. You know, why is it always so beautifully well defined? And the answer is, if you heat it in oxygen, then iron gets pulled out from the bulk, and you grow many, many, many new layers of magnetite through this process. And that's why it's so stable in the end. You have like quite a thick film of iron oxide, which is all with oxygen 18. But, but then it's not really an exchange. It's rather that you grow additional iron layers. That's with iron the oxygen. Yeah. So iron that's when oxide you, layers. That's when you do the preparation of the sample with oxygen 18. Ah, okay. The water experiment, that's an exchange. Right? That's a separate experiment where we take our sample, which is already labeled, and we dose water 16. Sure. And then what yeah, we see yeah. is an exchange of this oxygen 18 2 to 16 in the surface in the presence of the water. Well, that's one possibility, uh, but if that was the case, I would expect to see islands, smaller islands, on a flat terrace. Because we've done this previously with oxygen there, and that's precisely what you see. You, sorry, with platinum. You see your platinum islands, and then you really do have dissociation of oxygen from the islands onto the oxide, and then you have little islands of new iron oxide sitting around your platinum nanoparticles. I cannot be 100% sure. That's a reasonable question, but I don't think so. Because this thing can, so the iron oxides can be FeO, Fe304, and Fe203, and you can go through all three without changing the oxygen layers. So basically, you can pull it out or throw it in, and it's happy with almost any stoichiometry in between. So it's, and also the diffusion of the iron through the lattice is super easy. So I think what we're going to find through a lot of this work is that this thing is not just about surfaces, it's about the subsurface too, and the availability of these cations to go in and out of the lattice all the time. And this is going to affect things a lot more than what you might, I might have thought originally. Good. So then, otherwise, let's thank Gareth again and all the speakers.